Good, after, good evening. Uh, my name is Jamal Watson, and I am an assistant professor uh, of uh, strategic communication and public relations and the director of our graduate program at Trinity Washington University. So happy to have you all here joining us for this very, very important conversation with Ilyasa Shabazz. Before we begin, I would like to introduce, I would like to recognize rather a few individuals. I want to first uh, recognize and acknowledge uh, Provost Carlota Ocampo, uh, uh, Dean Peggy Lewis, our Vice President of Public Relations, Ann Pauly, who was very, very helpful in setting up this uh, event tonight and spreading the word. And of course, I would like to recognize and introduce President Patricia McGuire to bring some remarks. President McGuire. Well, Dr. Watson, thank you so much for organizing uh, this wonderful evening. We're all very excited. And uh, I will say in front of our great friend, Ilyasa Shabazz, welcome. Um, uh, Jamal Watson has been a wonderful addition to our Trinity family. Um, and his uh, networks have really um, amplified and, and uh, lifted up uh, the wonderful work we do here at Trinity. So thank you, Jamal. It is great um, to work with you. Uh, Ilyasa, I am so privileged to greet you, to welcome you to Trinity. I wish I could welcome you in person. Thank you for giving up your time tonight, your story. Thank you so much. Uh, the story of your father is one that um, has inspired me across the years. Um, and to meet you uh, now on this webinar is, is a great privilege. I know you will have a, a great inspiration for our students uh, and all who are listening. I welcome all of the several hundred uh, listeners tonight. Um, thanks to all. And uh, I'm going to sit back and enjoy every minute of this webinar. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank having Thank you, me. President McGuire. We appreciate you being here. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. So let me introduce our special guest. Uh, Professor Shabazz is an advocate for women and girl empowerment. Her life work is dedicated to helping others find inner strength and purpose. While she is frequently asked to speak about the legacy of Malcolm X, she shares that it is her mother, Dr. Betty Shabazz's wisdom, courage, and compassion that guide her. And I really am looking forward to talking about Dr. Shabazz mm -hmm. as well. She is an educator, community organizer, motivational speaker, and author of several award-winning books, most notably her first book, which I have right here called Growing Up X, which was a coming-of-age memoir. She went on to publish several other young adults and children books. She has received the NAACP Image Award, a Walter Dean Myers Honor, a Library of Congress Inaugural Award, an American Library Association, Coretta Scott King Honor, a Junior Library Guild Gold Standard Selection Award, and she was long listed for the National Book Award. She promotes higher education for at-risk youth, dialogue to build bridges between cultures for young leaders of the world, and she participates in international humanitarian delegations. She has produced training programs to encourage higher education for CUNY Office of Academic Affairs, she served for 12 years uh, in the city of Mount Vernon, New York, along with a 12-year appointment as Director of Public Affairs and Special Events. Um, she is on the Governor's Board for Neil Nang Rogers. We are a family foundation and, and has held, excuse me, advocacy roles at various group homes, lockup facilities, high schools, and college campuses with the production of her exclusive Wake Up Tour. Ms. Shabazz has replaced her father's footsteps to Mecca, explored religious and historical sites in Egypt, uh, and she has served as a member of the American Interfaith Leadership Delegation that participated with Malaria No More Foundation in Mali, West Africa. She also served as a member of the United States delegation that accompanied President Bill Clinton to South Africa to commemorate the election of President Nelson Mandela and his education and economic business development initiatives. She serves as a trustee for the Harlem Symphony Orchestra. She serves on the cabinet committee for SUNY New Pulse College, where she graduated, uh, and is chairperson of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center located in Harlem. Absolutely. All right, so let's, let's get right into uh, the discussion, if we can, because 
uh, you and I have known each other for some time and uh, we, we've had a conversation many times and I always love asking you, and I think it's a question that a lot of people have. And that is, what is it like to be the daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz? Oh, okay. So let's see. And you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> what is it like to be the daughter of Malcolm X? Well, you know, first I have to say, my parents were so young, right? And the height of their um, activism, you know, so to speak. And um, what an honor, you know, when I look back at the sacrifices that they made, but not only the sacrifices and significant contributions, but the, the model, you know, of manhood, of womanhood, uh, you know, all of the, I mean, just, I was just given so much, given so, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of information, um, a wealth of love. And the most important thing I'd say is my mother made sure that each of her daughters, all six of us, that we were very solid in um, understanding the significant contributions women made uh, to the world, understanding the significant contributions um, people of the African diaspora and the continent made to the world so that we were, we were raised with a very healthy sense of who we were. Our identity, our foundation was rock solid. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful um, to have had that kind of tutelage because as I, you know, got older and began finding my way in high school and in college, I realized that a lot of people didn't have that. A lot of people hadn't learned, um, you know, about people of color, about indigenous people. A lot of people might not have had the opportunity to have fostered this sense of self-love and, and, and strong sense of self-worth. And what I began to understand is that, um, you know, when you love yourself completely, understanding all of your value, all of your worth, and not relying on others to determine who you are, then you see yourself as a reflection of others. And so when they hurt, we hurt. And, and when there's challenge, you step in very readily, you know, to address those injustices or those challenges that others are feeling. And so growing up as Malcolm's daughter and as Betty's daughter, you know, I'm so grateful today, you know, when I look back at their individual sacrifice, um, their sacrifices and, you know, their, their commitment, determination, you know, that love. My mother used to always say that Malcolm loved his people and she loved her husband. And so mm. I said, I love both of my parents and I love my people, you know, so it, 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 it's, um, you know, this great understanding. If you believe in the oneness of God, you believe in the oneness of man, you believe in the oneness of woman. And so you see yourself as a reflection of others without regard to black, white, Muslim, Christian, um, blonde, brunette, you know, you just see yourself in the family hood of, of, um, of humanity. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanna talk for a minute about your mother because again, she watched her husband um, be assassinated, and yet she was able to to continue on, raise six girls, um, go on to earn um, a doctorate, uh, you know, from the University of Massachusetts. Started creating all kinds of programs to help others. Talk to me a little bit about your mother, and also about the book that you wrote uh, about your mother, because I love that book. Oh, I love that book too. I love that book so much. Yeah. Um, Betty Before X. It's a, a middle school book, but I think all my books are great for adult reading. Um, but my mother, you know, again, she was only in her 20s when her husband was um, assassinated right in front of her eyes. A week prior to that, on Valentine's Day evening, the evening of Valentine's um, Day, Valentine's Day, a firebomb was thrown into the nursery of their home where 
you know, we babies slept. And, you know, it doesn't matter how tough you can be to fight injustice. You are still human. And so my father was also a young man. He was only in his 30s. And so for my mother to have lived through a um, her home being firebombed, jeopardizing, you know, the life of her family, um, and then to a week later, you know, witness her husband's assassination has had to have been quite traumatic. And, you know, I remember always asking, well, not always, I remember, you know, and later in life, my mother had visited me and we were in bed together. And I had asked her like, you know, how are you able to, you know, overcome these challenges? And she said that, yes, she cried at night, but she didn't let her babies, you know, see her vulnerable, um, her vulnerabilities, um, you know, and that, you know, she never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself. And mm. so she went on with her six babies. I mean, she was pregnant with the twins when her husband was gunned down. And I mean, so <laughs> we know how challenging it is just to be pregnant. Um, and, you know, she just was amazing woman. She raised her six daughters. We went to summer camp, you know, in Vermont with, you know, to understand Quaker and indigenous um, values, Native American and values. Um, you know, we had history lessons where we had this um, Sheikh Tafiq who would come to our home and teach us about the history of Blacks, the history of women, the history of Islam, the history of Christianity, and, you know, just all of the things that she sacrificed for us at just a young age. You know, so my mother has just always been my role model. And um, she used to say, Ilyasa, just as one must drink water, one must give back. And had she fallen to, you know, these man-made challenges, she would not have been able to um, continue to live her life, to raise her six daughters, to mentor many, many young people, women, married couples, you know, in this country abroad, because she was just so giving. Um, she mm -hmm. was raised deep in the church, and and she also um, was uh, a progeny of the women who founded the um, Housewives League to ensure that in the 1940s that um, that stores num would number one sell product that were made by blacks, but more importantly that they would you you know if there was the meat packing industry, um, which was I think a billion dollar industry at the time, and so the 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 meat stores, the butcher shops would allow black people to come in and purchase goods, but they would not employ any of their husbands. And so they founded this um, Detroit Housewives League, which ended up becoming a national organization of women who, you know, who ensured that not only husbands, but their children and women were also employable, you know, mm -hmm. in the uh, meatpacking industry. And so that is where my mother comes from. And that is Primarily the story in Betty Before X. It's a really fun story for young girls growing up, you know, liking to do their hair, questioning themselves, their skin, um, and even seeing uh, the activism of young people back then and discovering that back in the 40s and the 50s, and I don't know, and probably even the 60s, when people were marching they would actually get dressed up in their Sunday finest because mm -hmm. they took such pride, you know, in themselves, right? Because if there was still segregation. They took such pride in themselves and they took such pride in wanting to make a difference. And, um, you know, I just found that so fascinating. And I also discovered that my mother played the drums, which really? was so surprising <laughs> to me. You know, that was really, really surprising to me. and. You know, and in writing actually Betty Before X, I discovered like, wow, this is why my father chose my mother. Um, they had mm. similar characteristics, similar ideals. You know, they were both quite compassionate. Um, they they under 
Well, my mother didn't understand completely, but, um, but you know, my father, I was gonna say my husband, my father, you know, of course, um, explained many things to them. And, and, you know, Jamal, it's so funny when I went to the Schomburg where my parents' papers are, I came across this folder. One folder was my father's and one folder was my mother's. And my father's folder had all of these news clippings of the various injustices that were occurring around the world that he was so enraged, you know, by these um, injustices, these human rights violations. And then my mother's were um, women don't want to argue. No, an educated woman doesn't argue. An educated woman has discussions and wants to debate. <laughs> you know, so I thought, <laughs> okay, so they must have been like chat, having challenging conversations and she was trying to let her husband know, listen, you know, I'm having these conversations and challenging you because I'm an educated woman and I want mm -hmm. to continue to learn and impart um, you know, my wisdom and, you know, which goes to, you know, the quote that I really championed um, and advocate for when you educate um, a young, when you educate boys, you uh, educate a community. When you educate your young girls and women, you raise a nation. Mm, yeah, no, that's very, very powerful. Um, so she was also very protective, of course, of her husband's legacy and ensuring that that legacy continued. And I, and you know, one of the things I wanna emphasize and many may not know, but she was an educator who worked for many, many years at Megar Evers College in, uh, in New York and was just involved in almost every aspect of social justice. So uh, certainly uh, really important to lift her up. And I think it's really meaningful for Trinity students, of course, with Trinity being founded as a women's college to understand that legacy of women and the important role that they play in society. Um, That's it, right. Yeah. yeah. That's no, right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so one of the things about my mother is she did, she safeguarded her husband's legacy because for so long, you know, we were told all of these, you know, things that were just ridiculous about who Malcolm was instead of realizing that this was a young man with such compassion with such vigor to change, um, you know, these in unjust laws that were created, um, you know, during a, a, a really challenging time and the most challenging time in history during the enslavement of, um, of Africans, during the enslavement of indigenous people. And it was important to my mother that all the work that my father did um, was for not to, um, make him into, you know, a celebrity or anything, but it was for the benefit of future generations to realize his work. And so, you know, it just, when I think of her, you know, and I remove myself from being her daughter, you know, I, I you know, would continue to uh, promote the ideals that she espoused, the, the, you know, all of the work, because she's such, you know, an inspiration. I mean, she, was a young pregnant woman with twins and four babies. She witnessed the uh, firebombing of her home, her husband being gunned down, right? I mean, just blown apart right in front of her. And she continued and she persisted. And I have to tell you this one story since we have an hour, right? Mm -hmm. So my mother was informally adopted. And what happened with her mother is her mother, was pregnant and was sent south to have her baby. And she went to Detroit and left her baby with her elder sister. And so when her elder sister passed away, my mother was about seven years old, her aunt Fannie Mae, Betty went to live with her mother and discovered, oh, my mother is not only a wife, but she's also a mother to three other other girls. Hmm. And um and so there were some challenging times and my mother ended up being informally adopted by the deaconess of the church, of really mm -hmm. famous church. And um, let's see now. I'm, I'm, so when my mother got older in 1972, I think it was eight, when I was eight years old, right? My mother already had six daughters and she was working to 
you know, make sure that she could take care of us because she couldn't get grants and loans and, you know, all of these kinds of things. So she worked very hard. She had a nursing degree. She went back and got her PhD. But she also created a young mother's educational development program mm. so that should young girls in high school find themselves pregnant, that they would not be sent south to mm. have these babies and interrupt their education but that they would that they could continue to they could continue with their education not be sh shunned and shamed by society and then she took it a step further and she was the chairperson of the Westchester Daycare Council so that once they had their babies they could then take them to the uh, daycare center where their children would be taken care of just to ensure that these young women never felt shunned by society shamed by something that happened to them and that their their education could not be interrupted. And it seems that many effective leaders around the world, Nelson Mandela, um, uh, um, a Bader, just so many, right? The focus is always on education, wanting to ensure that we all have the opportunity first to understand that we are worthy of a quality education but that we actually can have an, an education, but we wanna make sure that our educational curriculum is inclusive, that it's based on historical facts. That, yeah. You know, yeah. No, no, that's, that's really important. And I wanna talk a little bit about education more. Importantly, your experience going to college, because I remember you telling me that when you landed at college, the students <laughs> there had already voted I believe you president or leader of the Black Student Association when they found out that you were a Malcolm X's daughter. That's so right. tell me about that experience of being Malcolm X's daughter and then everybody having expectations that you were a certain way, right? That's right. So I was, I you know, first I went to the summer program at school. So I was 15. And then my birthday happened July 22nd. I became 16. So I was a 16 year old college, freshman college student. And I had gone to, you know, a predominantly white uh, girls prep school and graduated from a co-ed prep school. And, you know, I was, my mother was overprotective. You know, she really raised us in sort of a bubble, you know, because she wanted to make sure, I mean, listen, she saw her husband, you know, gunned down. She saw, you know, just a lot of, she had witnessed a lot of things and she was, really protective of us and um and you know and we were raised in this bubble of love peace and joy and that is not what people are expecting right because they think that malcolm is this you know all the things that he wasn't he was passionate about witnessing police brutality he was passionate about making change and making sure that people who had been psychologically traumatized generationally right that he gave them shock value to say you are worthy you have history look at these things that's happened to you you know we thought we were negroes but he said you know chinese people go to china italian people go to italy negroes we're, we're going to go to negro land they're going to go to black land there's no such thing and so trying to get us to understand the importance and necessity of having roots right and so now I'm forgetting where I was going with my story. And so what was your question? Well, my question was in terms of students' reaction to you being yeah, Michael Mason. Yeah. You know. So when I went to college, you know, they're expecting, oh, this fiery, you know, person uh, that they thought Malcolm was, was coming. My father was love, peace, uh, joy, right? That's what he wanted for everyone. He believed in, in uh, you know, protecting any human being, any group, uh, breathing creatures rights. Um, my children's book, The Boy Who Grew Up to Become Malcolm X, you know, you see the how these values were instilled in him. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. How these really amazing values were instilled in him by his mother, you know, who was uh, the, Nash, uh, the national recording secretary for the Garvey movement that commanded millions of followers in the 1920s. How their father was lynched. He was the president, the chapter president of this organization, and he was a minister. And so you get to see these, these specific values that are instilled in their children so that they could be compassionate 
see themselves as global citizens and navigate through a society that they clearly understood. And so um, when I went to college, you know, I, you know, coming from lo lots of love, you know, lots of joy and peace, you know, all I knew is just say no to drugs, you know, or, you know, to, you know, all these things that were popular in the, in the um, 90s, early 90s. And um, so they expected me to be really fiery and, you know, my little kung fu suit and, you know, power, to just, just a lot of things, right? Which I, and I wasn't, I was filled with lots of love and compassion. And so they wanted me to be the chairperson of the Black Student Union. Um, there was a, and I write about this in Growing Up X, which I just did the Audible for also, we'll talk about that. And um, this girl, Peaches, she wrote my speech for me. And, you know, I got up there and I just kind of like, you know, blew with the wind. I said the speech and I ended up becoming the chairperson of the cultural, um, uh, the, the, the chairperson of cultural something. Right. So I didn't make the chairperson, but I, I mean, of the Black Student Union, but I did get an office as the cultural chairperson. Sounds good. And I think one of the points that you make, which is really important, is that your father was responding to the climate and the social conditions that were um, were happening in the nation. So oftentimes when we 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 talk about Malcolm X. It's important that we put that in context, right? That's right. You know, my father basically said that black power isn't exclusionary, right? That black power is, you know, total. It's being included in the human family because for so long we were excluded, and so. Black power isn't exclusionary. It's re rooted in the ideals that um, uh, in the understanding that freedom is total and that no one should be left out because no one is free until all of us are free. And so just understanding that and having the capacity to not see these issues as black and white issues, but these issues of right and wrong. That is what is extremely important because we have these unconscious biases that we sometimes aren't even aware of, you know? And I also think that when people reference terms like by any means necessary, um, again, out of context, that he was responding to protecting his family really by any means necessary. And it's really important to understand what he was really saying, because oftentimes I believe that we take bits and pieces of what Malcolm said and, and try to construct a narrative that is not accurate at all. That's right, it's, but it's, it was intentional. You know, it was intentional to make us believe not to follow this man because this man is advocating violence. This yeah. man is advocating something that is untrue. You know, yeah. that, um, uh, you know, which is just really unfortunate. But now we're discovering, you know, oh, wait a minute. Now we understand what Malcolm was referring to, right? Mm -hmm. We understand that um, Malcolm had a profound reaction to these injustices, to these horrific, I mean, absolutely horrific injustices. And he spoke truth to power. And he... Uh, not only tried to make change here in America, but he traveled to Africa to gain support and figure out how can we best um, resolve, how can we best address some of these ongoing issues that are still happening today. Now, had we been better informed in the 60s and were, and were persistent with um, getting change, we would not have these same issues still um, persisting today. Yeah, yeah, no, so that's a good point. if we think that Malcolm was violent, and if we think all these terrible things of him, then we're not going to follow him. But what Malcolm said is, if you throw a firebomb in my home, you are going to instinctively get your family and usher them to safety. Not only that, once your family is ushered out of the harm of fire, the, 
the um, harm of the fire and out to safety, you're going to fight like the Dickens to put the fire out. And so it's just like these boots that are on our necks that we have to come together and figure out how to actually make change. And so this is a moment right for regenerative growth and responsibility. The political movement that was marked by uh, uh, COVID-19 and the failure, the utter failures of our government propelled national discourse around the movement for Black lives and the need for total systems change. We marched in 50 states in this country, right? We marched in, in protest and support of the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for Black lives in 18 countries abroad because we, or especially this generation is saying, we see that those in power have misused it. And now there has to be change. And we understand that the only way change is going to occur is when we are fully informed and we roll up our sleeves and, and say we are ready to do the, the necessary work and not stop until we've accomplished our goals. Because that is, you know, absolutely um, extremely important. Now more than ever is the time to commit to the work of radical institution uh, building. And those are some of the things that we are doing, um, as you know, um, Dr. Watson, and, and some of the things that you're even doing. Yeah. You know, I recently read a, a book a couple of months ago by Dr. Peniel Joseph, who I think you know at the University of Texas Austin called The Sword and the Shield, <laughs> uh, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King Jr. And I, I had a chance to talk with Dr. Joseph, and he said, growing up in New York, the way in which it's Malcolm X and Martin Luther King is often framed is you're either on team Malcolm X or team Martin Luther King. Um, you're often asked to choose between these two leaders. And I think what most people probably don't know is that your family was actually very close to the King family. Your mother and Coretta Scott King were almost like sisters. Um, you are very close with Dr. King's children, um, particularly Bernice King, Reverend Bernice King. So can you talk a little bit about that um, comparison between your father and Dr. King and almost this idea that we have to choose one or the other? Yeah, um, so yes, our families are close. I'm, I love Bernice with all my heart and, and her brothers. Um, I'm grateful, Bernice is grateful, we've spoke about it often, that our mothers had the opportunity to experience sisterhood, trust, love, a camaraderie. Um, and it's an unfortunate uh, thing that we, are, we have been conditioned to be divisive, um, that when Blacks make um, contributions, it's usually choosing and pitting one against the other, like Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, like Biggie Smalls and um, Tupac, right? Like Malcolm X and Dr. King, instead of just simply recognizing each for making a significant sacrifice and contribution. Um, when we're taught about Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, we're taught about their significant contributions. We're not taught to pick one or the other. That's, you know, and, and it's just a divisive um, uh, tactic. Mm, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, after all of these years, uh, many years after the autobiography of Malcolm X was written, it still is very much um, a popular text. And I'm sure many of our students at Trinity Washington University um, have read the book. Talk to me about why that book has been so popular and so important for, for so many Americans. Um, I'm, I'm, I was waiting for you to, to put the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have like, the book. You have like a magic hat over there. <laughs> but, you know, and listen, it's an accessible option. We now have um, released the Audible of the Autobiography of Malcolm X. The Autobiography of Malcolm X was on the bestseller list since it's published. Date, his publication date, 1966. Um, and so today, 
uh, maybe about a week ago or September 10th, we released the audible of the autobiography of Malcolm X, along with my growing up X. And um, it's an accessible option for those who've already read the autobiography and, um, to revisit it. And for those who want to experience it once again, uh, it remains a definitive statement within an ever evolving civil rights and human rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I think for young people, for even elders, who are just trying to understand what is this thing life all about? Why is there this continued police brutality, police brutality? Like what is happening? The autobiography is, you know, just, a, it's just really so amazing. Um, um, you know, it's a classic story that explains so much and there's so much wisdom gleaned from it. Uh, I know President Obama had even said in, in one of his books, uh, I think a story to my father, uh, some, whatever that book is, and you're not going to pull it out the magic hat, right? No, no, I, don't have it right here. <laughs> I know you have it. I know you have it. Um, but he said something like, you know, when he was trying to come to terms with who am I, right? Because certainly we're not learning much about who I am in school, right? which should be, and that's gonna be another thing that I, I do wanna um, just touch on. Um, but that, you know, he read Richard Wright, he read um, James Baldwin, and he was trying to come to terms with his identity. And mm -hmm. he said that most of the books that he read about these black men, they all grew weary toward the end of, his, uh, end of their lives. But when he read the autobiography of Malcolm X, that there was, you know, a, a you know, some a strength that there was purpose, mm. that you, you know, that there was the sense of urgency, that the identity was solid. And so um I would imagine when people say that it is a book that transformed their way of thinking, um, it is because of um, you know, it's just really because of this beautiful man, Malcolm X. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's all I can really say about him because, I mean, just like Ozzy Davis said when he did his eulogy, what did he, what, what wrong did he really do? You know, but speak truth to power. He said, if you put a knife in my back nine inches and you pull it out six inches, the knife is still in my back. It's not until you pull the knife all the way out from the wound that this blow made and then begin to address the wound, will, will progress and change happen? Will the wound actually heal? And now we can go on and use all of our limbs, right? So, you know, when you just, you know, when I think of my father, and not just because he's my father, but when I think of, you know, this young man during the 60s, you know, to have, you know, been lonely, to have been fearful, um, and in spite of all of that, his commitment to God, you know, his commitment to serve, his commitment to um, address these historical injustices, because look, you have never seen any, what, my father didn't blow any place up, he didn't shoot anyone, you know, he was uh, building uh, broken spirits and letting them know, you are worthy, you have history, you have purpose and stand in that purpose, stand in your worth, stand in your value. Because as my mother said, just as one must drink water, one must give back. We are all here for a reason. And you know, at the end of the day, which is inevitable, our lives will, you know, the way we will go on will matter, will be defined by what we gave. What, what kind of change we made. If we saw a dying person and just stepped over them, what would that say about our values? What does that say about us, yeah. right? Oh, no, that's, that's a really important point. I wanna ask you, and I'm sure it's gonna be a question, so I'll just preempt and steal the question beforehand. Um, because when Spike Lee made the movie Malcolm X, which by the way, is one of my favorite movies of all times, 
he introduced Malcolm, I think, to a new generation, um, to another generation. Um, we saw people wearing the X uh, caps and the well, sweatshirts. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was wondering if you could, number one, tell me what you thought about the movie, which again, I'm sure um, even young people who were born after the movie was was made have seen it because we, you know, it's, it's played on cable quite often. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about what you thought of the movie and and its historical significance? Well, um, you know, I thought, you know, Spike, he's a friend of mine. Um, I thought he did a great job. You know, he was very persistent and, you know, being the director of that film um, back then. Um, I, you know, I especially just loved how the American flag burned into an X at the opening. I thought that was just, you know, really artistic and creative um, and made such a, a strong statement because, you know, we are Americans. Um, um, you know, it was a great film because we're supposed to be this microwave generation. And, and, and I think this generation, of course, is changing. This generation really is the generation that's going to make the most effective change. But during that time, we were the microwave instant gratification generation. Um, and yet we sat still for three hours to watch this movie. And you know, you can put a child in front of that movie. And for the most part, they sit still and they watch it. You can put an elder, a black, an Asian, you know, all kinds of people. And you know, somehow it's Malcolm speaks to you. And um, so I think that Spike really did a great job with the film in introducing Malcolm. But after that, um, the sales in the autobiography and many Malcolm books, you know, just, you know, skyrocketed. Yeah. But I think it also forced the Academy to recognize the importance of Malcolm's contributions. We saw universities begin to offer courses on Malcolm X, uh, winning his papers and all of that. So I think it it also helped in many ways to, to again, provide some serious scholarship on Malcolm that had already uh, been done by some, but I think it reinforced the need for, for more. And I'm glad to see there are more books, including this one by Dr. Joseph and others that have since come out, which I think is really important uh, to understand uh, him. Um, I want to get to some questions if we, we can. And, and one question uh, that came in asked, you know, are you encouraged by the activists um, who have taken to the streets, you know, in the wake of the George Floyd killing and Breonna Taylor to really demonstrate and uh, to speak out against injustice? Absolutely. You know, um, I, you know, I think that when the most marginal communities are able to flourish and live outside the threat of police violence and have safe and adequate housing, education, um, health care, then we know everyone's needs are being met. And again, like my father explained, Black power is not exclusionary. It's rooted in the understanding that freedom is total and that no one should be left out of the human family because no single person or group of people are free until all of us are free. So yes, I think it's uh, it, you know absolutely important that young people are rolling up their sleeves and they're saying enough is enough. People in power have misused it and now there's got to be change. The, the thing that I would encourage is when we are marching, protesting and demonstrating that we are um, strategic, and that we are organized and we know why we are marching, that we have goals, that we have a checklist and we don't stop until we've accomplished uh, uh, items on our checklist. So that way when the protests and marches are over, we haven't gonna accomplished anything. Mm -hmm. Another question, what was it like growing up with uh, five sisters? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Did somebody ask that? Yeah, or yeah, you guys yeah. that? No, someone asked it. Yeah, yeah. It someone was asked. so amazing. It was just, you know, it was outstanding. You know, in retrospect, 
We have so many memories that we can laugh back on, um, you know, and I wrote, write about that in Growing Up X. And I think all my books are actually kind of, you know, they're entertaining, they are informational, you know, um, educational, and, um, you know, it's just, you know, they're really interesting. But it was great having five sisters. Um, for the most part, my two older sisters, you know, they didn't really want to hang out with the youngest, you know, the, with us. So I became the mother and it was always me and the three little ones. And it was just absolutely so exciting. You know, we just did everything that you can possibly imagine together. Yeah. Well, and I think have also, another... it also prepares you or one um, to be a good friend because you're able to navigate through so many different personalities and, um, and always have the person's back because you're, you know, like in my household, it was all about, you know, loving uh, one another and not placing judgment, but seeing a person for who they are and, and, you know, recognizing and accepting that. And, you know, you just determine, are, is this going to be a friend of yours or, or not? Yeah. Uh, we, we have a question uh, asking, um, about your identities um, as a Muslim, Muslim woman, a Black Muslim woman, how do you, um, you know, how how do you embrace that your dueling identities and the importance of that? Dual. Dueling, you, I... you know, yeah, being a Black Muslim woman. <laughs> well, it's who I am, right? Because that's, you know, just like my name is Ilyasa, I am a Black. Muslim woman. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, I learned about the, the, the significant contributions. And, and so I also, of each, of Blacks, of women, and of, of Islam. And uh, there was something else I was going to say, but it just ran out, out of my mind. But, you know, I, and I, love, I love me. My mother made sure of that. And I understand that you know, God is the only judge at the end of the day. And, you know, and I want to, you know, while I'm giving back, as my mother said, drink, one must drink water, one must give back, that I'm also living my life to its fullest um, so that, you know, I can give uh, as, as uh, well, you know, that I can. The question is, is, how concerned are you about the upcoming presidential election and again, getting, people, not just young people, but people in general out to the polls? Oh my gosh. I mean, it is absolutely crucial. That's what I will say. It is absolutely crucial. I'm very much concerned. And um, I think that, you know, we all have to understand the the power of our vote, but the necessity of the vote. And, and if it's something that we don't understand, then, you know, it's always helpful to have like study groups or to seek information out um because i know a lot of people some a lot of people are very clear on yes i am voting i understand the political process but then there are many who don't understand and 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 those are the ones that we have to make sure are are better informed so that they also understand the necessity and why for so long it was um you know made very it was against the law for women to vote, it was against the law for blacks to vote. Why is that, right? Mm. Because we are the majority, right? Mm. But then also, once we put people in office, that that, we, uh, that our job still continues. We have to make sure that we are holding them accountable mm. for, you know, you know, in return. Yeah, yeah. You are a professor. You teach at John Jay uh, College uh, in New York City. Talk to me a little bit about what that experience is like teaching college students and, and educating them um, in this era. Yeah, I, you know, I, I love it. I love my students. Um, you know, I had you come and speak to them to uh, each, well on several occasions. Um, uh, I love my students. They understand that when they come to the class that, you know, it's a safe space um, to have discussions, uh, you know, that we are there without judgment. Um, and it is important to stimulate the learning environment so that they are absorbing information and that they are encouraged with critical thinking and um, all the things that are necessary toward the development of young um, leaders. 
Yeah. Well, one of the things that's fascinating to me is the ways in which Malcolm X and even Dr. Betty Shabazz is known all around the world. I remember, I can't remember the year, whether it was 2015 or 2016, when we were in Australia, and to see the reaction from everyone in that country, um, you know, about how much they loved Malcolm X, and they knew and they'd read his book and they had followed his work. Um, and again, I think it's important to put him in context that he was not just an American figure, he, he was indeed an international figure as well, and a humanitarian, right? Right, and that resonates with um, so many people, you know, um, gay people, um, black people, uh, Jewish people, uh, you know, any, any group of people who have been marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember when we were in Australia, I wanted to see the indigenous Aborigines. I said, we're, we're the black. <laughs> I was like, can, can we see, can we meet some of the, the black Aborigines? I want to see them. And they were like, we are black. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, what did they look like? Mm -hmm. Very white. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. and it's really unfortunate, you know, because, you know, it was so intentional, the stolen generation, but that they, what was beautiful is that they were saying, hey, listen, I am, I'm black, I'm mm -hmm. an Aboriginal, but, you know, understanding, uh, you know, a film, Rabbit Proof Fence, which would be great for your students to see, um, that these were, you know, it was a generation of people where the women were raped, the, and then they had the tracker who would come and see if these children were biracial, they were kidnapped, and then they were brought thousands of miles away to an orphanage, and then they would in turn be raped until finally, in the fourth generation, they would be light or white, mm. and then they were worthy of being introduced into mainstream society because it was, you know, so for all these reasons. But I, I just remember this really handsome young man who looked like Brad Pitt. And he said, I am black. And I was like, <laughs> OK. And I took a picture with all of the, the you know, all of these um, students who said, you know, I'm black. And it was like, oh, my gosh, in America, you would not be considered that. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just goes to show that, you know, this black and white thing is just, you know, it's it's senseless. And so it's important to have the capacity to recognize right from wrong and not see it as a black and white issue, but see it as an issue of right and wrong. Yeah. I didn't ask you about this book here, which is called X a Novel, <laughs> um, but I like this book as well. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this book um, and why you wrote it. Yes. Uh, well, I'm going to say before I talk about X, well, okay. All right, I want to make sure that I talk about the two books. Okay, 727, we have three minutes. So X yeah. Novel is written for young people who find themselves at a crossroads. Um, like my father, his father was lynched. His mother was taken and put in an institution. His family was seized upon and broken up. And so he started navigating his life without you know, the guidance and protection of adults around them, right? And we see what happens with his life. So now I have in, in January a new book coming out, The Awakening, The Awakening of Malcolm X. And so it focuses more on um, how Malcolm was so, um, uh, what's the word, what's the word? You know, books were everything to him. He read everything that you can imagine. And so when he was in jail, that, you know, it was a time of self-discovery and he had an opportunity to read everything. And one of the most, uh, uh, oh gosh, one thing that we always, you know, I, I'm, oh, anyway, there's just so much to do. It, oh, it, it's, no, we got some, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We got some minutes, but <laughs> I feel like I have so much to say that I, I'm, well, we'll have to, well, we'll have to have you back again, uh, to do part <laughs> two for sure, for sure. Um, so you have a new book coming out, you're teaching, what else are you doing? Um, I'm the chairwoman of the Shabazz Center. I'm turning some of my books into animated, um, into some features. Um, uh, I'm on the board of ERA, Equal 
equal, what is it? Uh, equal, um, equal rights. Should, oh, uh, no. What is the know. ERA? Oh gosh. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a lot of, of things, um, you know, because I think it's really important, just as my mother said, just as one must drink water, one must give back. And, you know, I love being around people who are progressive, who, um, who are looking for their voice, who have a voice. Um, you know, I believe in teamwork, um, that we are as strong as our weakest link. And, um, you know, and I believe in, in, in this young generation. I believe in yeah. them. And, and, and it's what wakes, what gives me um, joy when I go to the Shabazz Center, because I know we have a great team there of young people, intergenerational. We have this um, dynamic director of institutional advancement. Um, who uh, you know just recently graduated from Harvard Masters Divin Howard Divin Harvard Divinity School, um, and so they give me hope and they make me excited to wake up every day um, just to engage with them. Yeah. For this so when you're, when you're in Harlem, make sure you visit the Shabbat Center for sure. Again, make sure you get uh, Ilyas's books uh, and read them because I think a lot of people want to know. I'm interested in Malcolm X. What should I read? And I would encourage you to start with the autobiography, wouldn't you? And I would. And then branch on from that. That's right. And in this book that we um, are releasing in January, The Awakening of Malcolm X, I put a um, a uh, list of uh, suggested books, and especially a list of the books that my father read during his youth, which still mm -hmm. have such um, great... Uh, um, everlasting power, you know, yes. information. Yes. Thank you so much. This is really fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I really learned some new stuff and I think it was a great opportunity to introduce you and your work and of course, um, honor the legacy of your parents um, in a conversation that our students and our faculty and our staff were able to participate. Again, I wanna thank President McGuire. I would like to thank Provost Ocampo. I would like to thank Dean Peggy Lewis, and of course, Vice President Ann Pauley for all of their hard work in helping me to organize this. And I think this is one of many conversations that we have to have uh, as we think about social justice and equity issues. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Okay.